Hola and welcome to a new episode of the Do Ruthless Dog and Pony Show. Episode number three of 2023. We've been having a lot of fun painting P22 uh, portraits and also painting uh, rabbits. Uh, we've been busy uh, painting outside, going to amazing spaces. So we're taking our time to start new collections this year because we want to savor um, the process. So today, actually, we're going to start a new painting collection. We usually give like at least 24 hours, but we were so busy yesterday. And so we are presenting the next painting collection. My name is Julio Panicello. I am the dream alchemist at Roofless Painters, a free range art school, atelier and gallery for 21st century romantics. With each episode, we reveal the theme of our next painting collection so you can find out uh, what we will be painting next and also the reason why this will take about like 30 minutes, maybe shorter because this is going to be a super simple, easy um, and we only have like maybe a few a few photographs. Um, we explore <laughs> we explore different possibilities for visual representation of the concept that we're going to use in the collection, and we use images of paintings uh, throughout art history. In this case, it'll be just like within a decade as inspiration, and also as a way of citing stylistic and historical references. This is going to be a very specific because it's based on the book that we're currently reading, Full Bloom, it's a biography, the biography of Georgia O'Keeffe. We're in the midst of it. And in fact, yesterday we had an amazing session, an amazing chat. We meet every week in which the uh, author of the book, Hunter Drahojowska Philp, uh, joined us and we had a lovely chat and she's going to join us again. But um, yeah, we are following her live uh, and there's one episode that... We thought it was interesting. Uh, we thought it was. Um, we thought it was interesting, and we thought it was a perfect uh, opportunity to actually um, inspire us to do our next painting collection. Hi, everyone. So um, there is a period of time, specifically, I would say, uh, 1920. I forgot how old Georgia O'Keeffe was, but she was. Uh, painting some still lives. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe was, a, she started to get like famous or uh, acknowledged or well known. Um, she had uh, an affinity or she was attracted to uh, pick up objects that were not conventional. We're talking about the 1920s, the beginning of the 1920s. And this was uh, right after the First World War, uh, devastating, a lot of people died. And uh, when the war ended, there was um, a lot of happiness and there was an explosion of expression. Um, and artists in particular, they were interested in uh, changing the subject and creating new um, ways or new concepts or new subjects. Uh, to use with their uh, paintings. And in her case, she always had a couple of um, ideas or a couple of approaches. One was um, to find unconventional um, subjects for her still life paintings. And the other one um, was related um, with the idea that certain fruits represented people. She painted a bunch of apples um, just because for her, apples um, had the meaning or they represented or symbolized people. If you can think of any Georgia O'Keeffe painting, um, whether you've seen it or not, whether uh, from live or whether you've seen it uh, in a book, um, Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, except for one occasion and uh, using watercolors and much earlier in her career, never painted figures. She never painted portraits. She never painted figures. She wasn't interested in representing the human body. Uh, but that doesn't mean like she didn't use subjects in order to link um, her um, 
idea of a person or uh, to reflect on how much a person a person meant to her. Um, doing it in a way that didn't uh, actually involve seeing someone and painting them. And one of the resources or one of the inspirations was uh, just picking or choosing like specific fruit. Um, in this particular time and a little bit before, apples um, were part of that uh, constellation of fruits that she used uh, in order to represent people. Um, so you see a still life um, from that time and you don't recognize or you don't see that those fruits were people, but the way in which she not only wrote about um, those uh, paintings, but also um, how she composed or arranged the paintings was very significant and very, very much a way for her to express uh, partnership, romance, involvement, engagement with someone else. Um, it's so amazing because you see her work and it's so stylized and so well studied and uh, thoughtful. Um, you could imagine that she was very verbal uh, in regards to explaining uh, what she meant when she painted things. But we were super surprised to know or to learn that Georgia O'Keeffe wasn't very verbal. She wasn't the type of person that was able to communicate her feelings um, easily. And part of it was because of her upbringing, um, but also part of it was because of who she was. So there are a lot of like enigmas and uh, a lot of cryptic elements that sometimes are not easy to decipher in her paintings. Uh, nevertheless, she left some uh, letters also and notes, but mostly letters in which uh, art historians like Hunter Drohodziowska, um was able to use to connect the dots. Um, one of the most significant aspects, for example, is that she used pairs. Pairs in the sense of like uh, numbers, not just like fruits, which she also used. But she, at, the, at this time, she kind of like used um, two things, two apples and two avocados. And we're going to the core and uh, the reason or the inspiration for our next painting collection. I never knew uh, of her avocado paintings. I'm going to read a little bit of her book, but um, I thought um, I thought that was incredible and the paintings look really beautiful. 1920, we haven't researched um, exactly uh, the history of the avocado fruit um, in the US, but that would be something that we're going to do just in a couple of hours when we start the webinar. Uh, when we paint and we talk about stylistic elements, not only we go through the stages of the painting, but at the same time, we take the opportunity to uh, learn more about um, the concept behind it and the history of things. So, um, Giorgio Keeves' uh, avocado paintings, I'm just going to show you maybe the most, whoopsie, uh, this is like a not a very a uh, good example, maybe. I'm just gonna see. Okay, well, maybe this is a this is a good one. It's a little bit blurry, but it's not the most famous one. Uh, so, the book. Is, I mean, we're in the middle of it. There's so much information. I already forgot some of the references from the beginning. This morning, I spent one hour trying to find out exactly where things were, but I couldn't. There's a an excerpt of excerpt of the book that explains. Uh, the reason uh, why she chose those fruits, it has to be, or it's related to also her uh, uh, sexual uh, appetite. Uh, and let me kind of like <laughs> put it out there. In the 1920s, after the war ended, um, there was a revolution and an embrace in uh, one's sexuality. This was like uh, uh, Freud's... Um, apex, I would say, or the most important uh, time in his career and his premises and studies uh, were pretty much uh, part of the intellectual conversations of the time. Not only that, but just because of people getting tired of the devastation of the war, there was an explosion of um, affirmation and identity and the idea of self. And uh, so there was no shame in just 
uh, embracing your own sexuality. And that meant that uh, sexuality was part of conversations like uh, romance and affection and emotional uh, engagement. Um, part of the reason why she chose uh, avocados is because of precisely that. You know, it was a way of like using a subject matter that wasn't necessarily um, popular or hasn't uh, haven't been uh, hadn't been used in the past by uh, classical impressionist painters. Um, she always tried to find something strange and weird, uh, and also arrange it in a very specific way. But this is a good example of her avocado paintings. She did a bunch of them, a bunch meaning maybe like um, a series of like six oils at some point. But previously, she also did. Uh, I believe a few sketches or watercolors. Look at the composition. Look at the way. Oh, Georgia O'Keeffe, by the way, was also very much interested in the idea of uh, how to hang a painting. And sometimes, even though she used simplification and a bit of abstraction because of the modernist elements that were sort of like talked about at the time, uh, she was interested in. Um, maybe finding different options to hang paintings, not just the typical one when you do a figurative uh, uh, rendering of something. Um, this almost looks like it's uh, an upside down painting, but that's the way it's supposed to be uh, um, hanged on a wall. So uh, really um, interesting composition in, in the sense that there is a, a zoomed in or up close. This had to do obviously with the advances in photography, not technological advances, but the idea that photography at the time was already considered like uh, a high art or um, there were a lot of photographers that were working <clears throat> or they were using uh, the medium in order to uh, create more of a pictorial photography. That's a trend that happened at the time. And uh, because she was part of that group of people that were using photography in very new ways, there was an influence between the composition, framing, and arrangement, and point of view that photographers at the time were using, and the way she actually approached paintings, uh, and how she framed them, arranged them, and used a very specific point of view that was pretty much very photographic, if you want to say that. So, um, yeah, we're going to paint um, um, alligator pears. I don't know if she came up with that name. Uh, she didn't use the word avocado. Uh, she spent uh, a lot of time, uh, I think she was in her 20s by then. She spent a lot of time in Texas. She was an art teacher. Uh, art education was part of her life at the time. She thought she was going to become an art teacher for the rest of her life. Things changed, obviously, later. Um, so I just wonder, uh, we're curious about the history of the avocado fruit. And in the 1920s, um, I'm from Spain. We didn't get avocados until maybe uh, the 90s. <laughs> it wasn't a fruit that was uh, found in markets or anything like that. So I didn't grow up with this fruit. So I just uh, imagined that there were parts in the U.S. that um, this fruit was perhaps native. But certainly, I'm not imagining New York uh, having avocados at the time. And some of the oils that she painted um, were in New York, by the way. Uh, but we'll just talk a little bit about the reason why these were called um alligator pears um, in the t in the titles of the paintings and also the way um, she refers to them. Uh, alligator pears, I'm going to just show you uh, another example of her avocado uh, series. And um, again, this idea of a pair of uh, alligator pears um, I just thought the whole thing was quirky and funny and interesting, uh, humorous, and also uh, aesthetically so clean and beautiful. And I like the conceptual element also of the sensual aspect, the idea of like bringing two, the shape of the avocado. So I think um, we haven't used avocados as the prime uh, subject matter of our paintings in all the uh, many years that we've been creating uh, collections of paintings. Uh, avocados have come up 
um, at least in one collection that I recall, when we did the bento boxes, I remember that we used photographs, uh, aerial photographs of bento boxes, and some of them had avocados. Uh, but other than that, um, I just can't believe that we haven't used avocados as a subject matter. So we're going to get inspired by uh, Georgie O'Keeffe's avocado series or alligator pears. We're going to talk about um, the reason uh, why she used them. I'm just going to read an excerpt to conclude. I have maybe one more painting, but I just wanted to read something that the author writes about uh, the avocado uh, series. So this was 19, actually uh, 1923. And by the way, she isolated the fruit. Um, also, she didn't bring perspective. Uh, there's no uh, indication of anything beyond the surface and the fruit. The focal point is very specific. The point of view is very specific. But in all the avocado paintings, um, I'm going to give you um, an example of one that although it isn't technically a pear, uh, I believe, in my opinion, the focal point, um, oh, I don't know why this is so uh, strange, but I believe the focal point, um, uh, there are two focal points. So this is another uh, avocado study, and there's one single avocado, but there is almost taking more space than the actual avocado is the cast shadow of the avocado on a flat surface. Maybe not a pear, but certainly perhaps this idea of being the shadow of something, the shadow of something or someone. Um, so, yeah, let me just see, kind of like read this. Um, she returned as well, this was 1920, uh, to the avocado. Intrigued by its shape, she kept, she kept one until it turned light brown and became so hard she could shake it and hear the self or the seat rattle. A year later, in 1923, so this is obviously 1922, 1923, she copied, uh, copied uh, uh, the avocado, the painting, as a somber ovoid sitting on a white cloth, which is this one right here, this painting. When Alligator, um, alligator Pear was printed on the, uh, in the Dial, which was a magazine, she felt that it was a demonstration of her best instincts, Quote, I have always considered that it was one of the times when I did what I really intended to do, end quote. She said, one isn't always able to do that. Um, she also used pastel, avocado, alamin, I'm sorry, alligator pears, and some ab abstraction. And people love these paintings. Um, um, so there's a little bit let me see if I have the final one and again we're just going to paint avocados and I'm just going to give you my take on this and uh, <clears throat> oh, this is also a really beautiful study it's only one but this is a uh, part of the avocado or the alligator pear series it's one single avocado but she's also playing with the idea of space a negative space in this case the negative space becomes becomes positive space and the avocado almost becomes the negative space so there is also, um, uh, I would say, a much more sophisticated and intentional level of abstraction in the painting, uh, obviously. But, you know, unless you look at the title and you connect this with a series of paintings of avocados, I wouldn't know that this is actually uh, uh, still life of an avocado. She worked by using observation, by the way, but... Sometimes when uh, she included or incorporated uh, abstraction in uh, the figuration, she used visualization. So I think her thought process um, was so meticulous and so clean, uh, so sophisticated, um, so um, sort of like not provoking in the sense that obviously there are many associations, sexual associations with two avocados. And I'm not talking only about a specific body part, let's go there, but I'm also talking about other uh, body parts. And the author, in this case, she makes a case about perhaps having a reference of memory um, significance, you know. Uh, who knows? Um, Alfred Stiglitz and George O'Keefe had a very passionate uh, beginning of their tumultuous uh, relationship. It was... A bumpy ride, but certainly at the very beginning, uh, the very beginning, the physical attraction 
was intense. And again, in the context of this after post-war uh, sexual embrace, uh, some of the correspondence was very, um, very hot, <laughs> very physical. Maybe she wasn't as uh, verbal, but she was certainly uh, not very prude. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Okay, this is just going a little bit off rails. But here's my suggestion. Uh, obviously, it's too short. We usually give 24 hours, but we're going to start the webinar in a couple of hours. If you have avocados at home, uh, use them. Uh, my suggestion, use two, um, just because I like the kind of like, I'm going to use two. I like the innuendo. I like also the tribute, not just innuendo um, in a dirty way, but I also like the tribute to her embracing uh, the subject matter and uh, the way she painted it. Um, and don't cut him. She never painted a cut avocado. You know, usually, and that's also something that I find intriguing. Um, if you type avocado uh, paintings, you're going to see a bunch of like cut with the seed and the beautiful avocado, light avocado color. There's something so um, attracted, attractive about uh, the flesh of the avocado, the transition of the colors from yellow to green. Um, again, the pastel aspect of it. So also the architecture of a half avocado, you know, the big bulky seed, um, the part of the seed or the part of the avocado where uh, the seed leaves a hollow imprint. It's amazing. It's an incredible shape. What I'm going to do, I'm going to pick two. I'm not going to cut them. Uh, just one also uh, to experience uh, this idea of alligator pear. In my head, alligator pear means uh, kind of like the reptiles, the reptile-like uh, texture and color, uh, the toad skin of an avocado, which we consider ugly, but uh, that's one of the greatest things about Georgia O'Keeffe also. She took the mundane, the quote-unquote ugly, and then she created something extraordinarily sophisticated and specifically um, aesthetically strong and beautiful. Avocado paintings, we're going to call this uh, alligator pears. Um, we come, we're starting in a couple of hours. Thanks for being here and uh, listening to this whole presentation. Uh, the session is three hours, 20 bucks, two hours painting. Jen uh, will be there helping us navigate the concept, bringing the history of avocado fruit. Sometimes there is an, a dark history uh, of fruits that we don't know about. The citrus history of fruits in LA has a dark past, for example. So we're going to find out uh, how avocados uh, made it to the US, uh, who was able to eat avocados, afford avocados. Uh, and also, we're going to talk about Georgia O'Keeffe a little bit, and we're going to gossip about what were her intentions when uh, she painted avocado pears. Thank you so much, and you can register online. Uh, the link is on our calendar. The session is scheduled. We're going to start um, in just a bit, but also before I... And the transmission, <laughs> um, I will say that we're going to take the theme for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have a couple of very exciting locations that we're going to be working from. Uh, we're going to announce them in um, a few days, but um, uh, next week it's going to be raining at trails. So we're going to do a remote session instead. Uh, we're just uh, hunkering down and not going outside for the moment. But... We're going to be hosting a few sessions in which we're going to bring images of alligator pears and we're just going to paint them. So we'll see you in one of those sessions, hopefully in the webinar that starts uh, the painting collection. Bye, everyone.